Hello, everybody. Welcome to Creating Pollinator Pathways. So today we are joined by the Pollinator Pathways Project to uh, talk all about pollinator gardens. So before we get started, I just want to mention a couple of housekeeping items. So when you first entered, um, generally you are muted, um, but some of you may not be. So please check and mute yourself so that um, I don't have to mute all of you at once, but I will if I have to. <laughs> um, that way we don't have background noise. Um, your cameras are automatically off, so you're in a listen-only mode. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention was that this is being recorded. So if you can't stay for the whole thing, um, in a couple of days you'll receive the recording and get to listen all over again. So thank you so much for joining. Um, and we're also just, yeah, so thankful to have uh, Pollinator Pathways with us. So next slide, please. Oh, the one with the logos. Perfect, thank you. So first I'll just quickly introduce myself. I'm kind of moderating tonight. I'm Kelsey Nichols. I'm the Signal Boost Coordinator with Reforest London. And if you're not familiar with us, we're a local uh, charitable nonprofit that plants trees and um, enhances the environmental and human health of the forest city through the benefits of trees. Um, what's less well known is that in 2019, we also became the founders of the new Westminster Pond Center for Environment and Sustainability. So it's going to be a great community hub full of um, environmental services and programming. Um, and it's going to have a big impact on um, enhancing the sustainability as well as the health and well-being of our region. Um, and so one project of this new Westminster Pond Center is the Signal Boost Initiative. And the Signal Boost Initiative is all about um, holding educational events at the center. Um, and so obviously we can't have events at the center during the COVID shutdown. So in the meantime, uh, we're happy to bring you some um, online webinars, uh, which is actually great because we're actually able to reach a lot more people. Um, and so this event is also a part of uh, my wild green home. And we actually have Leah from London Environmental Network here to tell you a little bit about what that is. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry, I was muted there. Um, thanks. Thanks, everyone, for attending this workshop. I'm Leah and I work at London Environmental Network, which is a nonprofit organization uh, that aims to build participation, collaboration, and capacity in our community to co create positive environmental change in London. And we are also co organizers of the Go Wild, Grow Wild Green Expo, um, which is now bringing wild and green adventures virtually through our new venture, My Wild Green Home. So this webinar is part of the My Wild Green Home virtual experience uh, to go, grow, and get green safely at home. And together we're growing a movement for a healthy planet and a green future. And you can learn more about My Wild Green Home as it evolves um, at gowildgrowwild.ca. Thanks, Kelsey. Great, thanks, Leah. Sorry about that. I think I had to unmute you because I muted everybody. <laughs> My apologies. Um, and so I just want to mention, so uh, I want to thank our sponsor for the event, which is the Ontario Trillium Foundation. All right. And while we're at it, if you enjoy this event tonight, talking about pollinator gardens, there's a big range of different topics for the upcoming events. So next week, same time, uh, same place. <laughs> There's composting 101. You can then learn all about biking to work, um, a full day intense permaculture workshop, uh, all about wild foods, so growing um, edible foods with growing chefs. Um, and I also just want to mention if you have kids at home, check out the Seeds to Forest Homeschool Edition program where there's just lots of uh, nature-based activities that you can do for free, all um, offered at reforestlondon.ca. And if you ever have any questions about these events, uh, you can go to that website to check it out or uh, let me know at signalboost at reforest11.ca. And uh, with that, I will pass it over to Gabor. Good evening, everybody. My name is Gabor from the Pollinator Pathways Project. It's very good to be here with you. Um, I will be giving a, an overview of our project, 
talking about how how to set up, create these polymer pathways. We'll also have Sylvia and Jude talk about reaching out to youth. And Alex will give an overview of how you can uh, use our online resources. We have some maps there, some things to download, and, and so he'll take you through that. All right, so let's let's get going. Creating. Okay, there we are. <laughs> okay, so the plan for tonight um, is is going to take us through the the three H's: the head, heart, and hands, but in a slightly different order, because I believe that to have a real uh, meaningful transformative transformative learning experience, you really have to work with all uh, three parts uh, of, of, of our bodies. We, it's not just uh, the, a cognitive understanding the topic, but we really need to feel, we need to, you know, falling in love with subjects, right? You all of you know that they're passionate about something. You have, there's that heart effective component. Um, and then we want to put it into action. So the first question is more about, you know, what, why are we talking about polymer pathways? Second is, is how, what are polynomial pathways? And finally, under hands is how do we, how do we create these polynomial pathways in urban areas? So before I get started about why we should care, I just want to give a, a shout out to all these amazing uh, creatures, which um, help um, pollinate 85% of, uh, of flowering plants. So bees, butterflies, wasps, moths, beetles, flies, birds, bats, they all do a part. Now where we live, bees and butterflies are the, are the creatures that do most of the heavy lifting. As we move towards the tropics, uh, moths become more important birds, bats, but certainly we have examples of, of, of each of them uh, here as well. We can think of hummingbirds, different flies that do pollinating services. And, and uh, let's not forget that there's also wind pollination. And in some parts of the world where we have uh, unfortunately killed off most, most of these pollinators, well, humans have to get involved. So there's some orchards in China where people pollinate by hand. So why do we, should we care and do we care? Uh, you've probably seen some of these studies that suggest uh, huge insect declines. So this one from Germany, where they observed a 75% decline over three decades. Here's the article in a bit more detail. So these are nature reserves embedded in, you know, the heavily built out landscape of Germany with agriculture and urban areas. Uh, so nonetheless, in these protected areas, they found a 75% decline. So this is huge. And here you can see the graph of the, the biomass that they've measured over, over these 30 years and across 63 different uh, uh, reserves. So you can see a sub substantial decline. So what happens when you lose these pollinators and other invertebrates? Well, they have knock-on effects on ecosystems because they are you know, part of the food chain and other creatures are relying on them for food. So if you take them away, well, then you, you have other creatures that go missing. So here's uh, another study. This is from North America. 2.9 billion birds have gone missing in the last 50 years. Now, this is not just due to the decline in the food availability, so on insects and other invertebrates. There's other things in here as well but still uh, it's a precipitous decline. And part of it is, is the, the decline in insects that we've been observing. Birds go missing, lizards go missing too. And you know, if the whole food web is impacted. So this is another study from, um, uh, I believe it's Puerto Rico. And you can see from, uh, from the seventies to 2011 and 12, there was a, a big decline in these uh, in these lizards, these animals, uh, in, in the tropical rainforest there. Now, by bringing it home to what it means for us humans to make it really visceral, well, we have we 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 get you know if if you take away all the pollinators, we'd have 33% less uh, 
food available because 33% of our food that we eat uh, directly rely on pollinators. So if there are no pollinators, uh, you can kiss goodbye to almonds, apples, watermelons, strawberries, raspberries, and there's a whole list of, uh, of foods that we eat. Others will be impacted. There'll be smaller yields because pollinators really help, help boost the yields of coffee, beans, tomatoes. And can you believe that beef, milk, eggs are also impacted? How come? Because these animals are eating feed that are plants that are um, you know, pollinated by pollinator so so they they would be impacted too um, now what why so obviously we, we should care because uh you know it'll impact our ecosystems our food uh but i think we should care just because of the beauty of these of these uh, animals i mean just have a look at these these beauties from uh, from ontario where we have uh 400 species of bees so these are native bees uh, obviously, the um, uh, we have the honeybees, which are introduced species from Europe, but uh, there's 400 of these native bees that we uh, that are um, that also uh, are not all of them are in decline, but a large part, portion of them are are in decline, and and some of them uh, have gone extinct in Ontario. Uh, there's 100 species of butterfly, so there's a, a rich biodiversity here in Ontario. Um, that is being threatened. So in the second part, sec for the second question, um, what are pollinator pathways? So let's, let's, let's get into this topic. And where I like to start because I'm an ecologist is with, with, with the, the subject of ecology, which is looking at relationships. So how do different animals eat each other and how they eat plants, but it's also about uh, the energy transfers, the, the gas transfers for carbon dioxide into trees and plants and, and looking at all these processes and how they interact. So um, David George Haska does an amazing job at, in, at, um, at describing these uh, relationships in, a, in really poetic form. So uh, if you'd like that kind of read, the forest unseen is beautiful. And if we had, would have more time, I would show you this nice video that he talks about these the amazing relationships. Uh, of course, pollination is all about relationships. It's the relationship between the pollinators, these butterflies and, and the various plants where they transport pollen from, um, from the male part, the stamens. And when they visit another flower head, then the pollen, some of those pollen pieces uh, fall off and fall into the female part, the pistil uh, of the flower. And then that can lead to uh, fertilization uh, there and, and then the fruit uh, develops. So when you, when we, if you take away, let's say the bees, the pollinators, well, of course, it will have huge effects on the plants. The, the plants will uh, then suffer or, you know, if, if you take away all the pollinators, well, then they'll they'll uh, die out uh, as well. Or uh, what if we are removing the the plants because we are applying herbicides or whatever? Well, we're we're breaking down the relationships. And of course, I've shown you that uh, these uh, you know they'll the, uh, t take away any of these uh, species, and you will have knock-on effects in, in ecosystems. So what are the causes um, of species loss? So here, it's a, I'm asking a bigger question because it applies to not just pollinators, but, but all species. Um, and if we would have time, I would stop and somehow would interact with you and you would sh uh, shout out various answers. And some of these would be habitat loss, degradation, habitat fragmentation, but there's also invasive species, climate change, there's diseases, parasites, uh, application of pesticides and chemicals and all of that. Uh, but the main one, so if we had to name one, the biggest one so far has been habitat loss and degradation and fragmentation. So here you can see uh, in London, we've gone from a landscape with contiguous forest uh, to a landscape where we have these remnants uh, and this is for 1950, and now these remnants have become even smaller and fewer uh, in between. So 
So you can imagine that for uh, especially the bigger species, um, the predators especially, you know, they, they have they, they have huge uh, huge trouble existing in these landscapes. But now the patches have become so small that even the small insects are are getting into trouble. So what can we do about them? Well, one of the main ways conservationists have been trying to uh, piece together these, these smaller bits and pieces of, of habitat is by creating corridors. These pictures are from the Banff area. You've probably seen these. Uh, then they are heavily used by the animals as they cross from one side of the highway to the other. In agricultural landscapes, where uh, I guess where we are, uh, hedgerows can act as ecological corridors. Riparian forests can act act as ecological corridors. And there could be, and I'll show you some more, uh, you know, more stepping stone type corridors, little habitat patches where birds can land, you know, insects as they hop from one to the other. So do they actually work for pollinators? I won't get into this uh, because we don't have time, but uh, in these landmark studies from 2005, what they've shown in this forest setting is that where you have uh, patches connected up, then butterflies, bees, wasps, they move along these low quality co habitat corridors to the, to the other uh, bigger habitat patch. So uh, corridors help to increase dispersal, gene flow, and, um, and so allow these pollinators to, to have uh, bigger, uh, better habitat. And I could also show you uh, uh, studies that are now lo are looking at urban areas, uh, showing that these, uh, uh, these pathways or these corridors, they do help uh, uh, pollinators and insects and, and other creatures. So here you can see uh, some examples of where they are more uh, like linear features in the landscape. So from New York, the High Line uh, Park, or along uh, hydro corridors, transportation corridors, uh, you can set up beautiful uh, pollinator meadows and gardens, or you can do more stepping stone gardens throughout neighborhoods, uh, uh, or they could be s s larger pollinator meadows in various parks, and, and that, that allows these uh, animals to move across the landscapes. Okay, so here's an example uh, of a, a pollinator pathway uh, from the Circe Society. This is um, um, a an, an really nice example of what a local pollinator pathway looks like. So this could be in any of our neighborhoods, right? If, if if all of us did a, a little bit, you know, some of us might be setting up a prairie pocket because we love prairie flowers, others have flowering shrubs, vegetable gardens, fruit trees. Uh, the city decides to plant a flowering uh, median um, on, on the roadways. Others are setting up native bee lawns, rain gardens um, with, with flowering plants. And so, so here we're giving them a, a rich diversity of places where pollinators can get food, can find shelter uh, at, at different uh, life stages. So it's important to think about the caterpillar stage for butterflies and so on. And um, uh, the nest uh, requirements for various bees, many, most of them, most of those native bees in Ontario, they actually ground nesters. So uh, all of you gardeners out there, leave a patch where you don't mulch too heavily so that the, the bees, bees can find their little cavities in, in the soil. Okay, so some examples from around the world. There's now more and more organizations that are taking this pathway approach. Uh, and um, here's some urban examples. So the Meadowway is, is being built, I believe. There's uh, blooming boulevards. The, maybe you've heard of the Butterfly Way project. Is a Canada-wide, um, led by the uh, David Suzuki Foundation, and then there's also rural projects around the world. Uh, so I'll just um, headline the Calgary Bee Boulevard because it's uh, they they have a very exciting news to share with us because they found along this this Bee Boulevard they they set up in Calgary they found the one of the endangered. Uh, that they, they haven't seen in that area in a long while. 
they found two gypsy cuckoo uh, bumblebees. So that's pretty cool. You know, you build it and they come. So you can see in these pictures, they not only set up uh, a nice wildflower meadow, but they have this bee hotel in the background. So cavity nesters, uh, they probably have uh, little ponds, so areas where bees can get some water because they, they get thirsty too. Okay, so really what's needed is a multi-scale approach where we have neighborhood gardens. So these are, you know, one kilometer to a few kilometer in size, city-wide pollinator pathways. This is really helping the population dynamics of, of pollinators. Okay, so along you can see this uh, dashed line going across London. There's parks along here. And if we set up a nice pathway around there, that, that would be, you know, a, a citywide pathway. Or, and then we can talk about regional, like the, the, the Carolina and Canada meta corridor uh, concept. Okay, so pathways are, are all, um, a social system. So it's really important. Uh, and so it's not just the ecosystems providing these services for us. You know, they, we get food because they pollinate etc cetera, etc cetera. but um, you know when we when we start thinking about these polymer pathways and we start thinking about the human network well we gain so much more than just the the fact that there's uh, uh, flowers being pollinated uh, I mean ecologically absolutely that's what we're going for but um, you know we, we we build this network this sharing network of knowledge and information and um, um, and we build, uh, de uh, develop a stronger sense of place, we, we can build community, uh, and in essence, we're building a more resilient urban ecosystem by focusing on not just the ecological network, but the social network. And then we can uh, expand this to think about governance, so bringing ecology into governance, you know, when we, where we have these uh, informal, loosely connected networks, because not, uh, you, uh, you know, problems are multi-scalar, multi-jurisdictional. Multi City of London can solve it, or the province of Ontario can solve it. They need multiple actors, and so we need, uh, for these problems, we need network governance that can be more adaptive, more dynamic, uh, and so uh, I believe that's also important. Okay, so let's talk about, I have about five more minutes to go here. Um, so what, a, uh, what about um, here in London and what have we been up to? Alex will, will talk a lot more about uh, the website. Um, but, and I, I, I'm just reminded by, I look, looked at my notes and, and I realized that I wanted to ask two questions uh, of the audience. So we have two polls because uh, we would like to find out how, how you found out about this webinar. So, Kelsey, if you could put up uh, that poll. I would, yeah, so great. So I'm seeing 31% uh, uh, the, the P3 social media, 31% Reforest London social media. Uh, excellent. Okay, so I think we can uh, close this one, uh, this poll. And, uh, and then the follow-up poll would be on um, how many people are so per uh, per sign in, how many how many attendees are watching the, the webinar? Most of you are, are uh, as I would expect, are watching, listening alone. But there's uh, there's some some of you where there's there's two people. So that's that's kind of what what I expected. Uh, I guess no big families uh, sitting around the the fireplace i mean the computer <laughs> watching this all right so thank you so much again for tuning in and we're going to do a bit more interactive uh, uh things uh, in a second when alex takes over so let me just go back to this presentation um and and tell you about the essences of, of our projects is really to empower people to plant a pollinator garden and then grow that network of gardens so we've had workshops, uh, we have handouts, and we've posted two of them, so you can download them or you can go to our website. And uh, those of you who have not done this type of work, can you see yourself starting with a one meter by one meter patch? 
uh, let's start small and then and then work up from there. Uh, you're wondering what species you could pick. Well, we have a flyer for that. These are easy to source, easy to plant, easy to maintain species. If you have a sunny pollinator garden, you could pick some of these. So make sure you think about the the, the, the food needs of pollinators from the spring all the way to the fall. Okay, so so you want to have a diversity of flowers and. Uh, and try to go all native because many of the native uh, pollinators will only feed on native plants. Um, there some of the generalists will also feed on lavender and, and other things that are not native. Um, but if you can, try to go all, all native. And um, here's some of the, the key tips that you could follow. No pesticides, have a diversity of flowers. Don't forget about, about water. Mulch lightly or leave, a, especially in a southern exposure, leave, leave the soil bare and then embrace the decay uh, in the fall because there's some cavity nesters that need that. Okay, uh, social is just as important. So I'll just show you some examples of what we've been able to accomplish. We've been really working at the neighborhood scale. Uh, and if we look at uh, the neighborhood where I live and there's four others uh, from the project, the member, the core team who live here and we've, um, We've been able to kind of empower a whole bunch of our neighbors. You can see these yellow dots and uh, a lot of these yellow dots, uh, so they're all gardens, but they came about because of the project. Um, we, we also helped out by sourcing some, um, some mulch and some plants. And then we planted a community garden here where you see the red. So I'll just quickly go through that you can see some pictures of how we took over this traffic median. So there's some ideas there. If you have right of ways in your neighborhood, you can um, uh, you can adopt the street and and plant a, a pollinator garden. So here's some pictures. Here are some of the individual uh, pictures. The the one in the 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 left bottom left. You can see that's one meter by one meter. Uh, my my neighbor Jimmy said, "Okay, Gabor, I'm going to do one meter by one meter." So there, there it is. And here's some other pictures from around the neighborhood. And of course, the pollinators that are attracted to the plants. So you build it or you plant it, and they will come. Um, our next project is is more trying to go citywide. And here's this is where uh, working with other organizations become a, becomes a lot more important. So the Dundas Street Pollinator Pathway is our next project. And we are hoping to set up two gateway gardens, perhaps uh, canoe gardens like this one, and then, and then get businesses and other people who live along the corridor to consider planting maybe just in a pot or in a bigger planter box, some pollinator plants. And then I think it's the, the table is set um, or, or things are ripe for a, a citywide discussion on talking about citywide pollinator pathways. And here's where uh, Thames Tablet Land Trust, Reforest London, City of London, and a whole bunch of other organizations, we can talk uh, in setting up uh, these cross city pathways along uh, transportation corridors like the, the, the rail lines or, or stringing together parks. Uh, and setting up these stepping stone pollinator meadows, for example, along these uh, red, so the red um, dashed lines would be like, you know, uh, potential po pollinator pathways. The blue ones are the, the river networks that already have really well-established ecological features. So yeah, governing together, you know, as part of this uh, this network approach, I think that's the, that's the next step. And here's some organizations that I listed that have uh, that we've already talked to, and I think the next step is to sit down and, and start creating these pollinator pathways. So in wrapping up, create uh, creating pollinator pathways, create the habitat if you can in your own house and your balcony. Start small, pot to meadow. You know, if you have a big organization, you can think in the meadow scale. Businesses have reached out to us. Uh, don't forget about the other requirements of pollinators: water and host plants for caterpillars. And then second, work with others to create more habitat, reaching out, building your networks, neighbor to neighbor, organization to organization, advocate for pollinators, 
And those of you who are really into the scientific part, there, well, you can study pollinators. There's some, something called citizen science that you can get involved with. So thank you very much. And now I'm going to give it over to, to Sylvia, who will talk about uh, reaching out to youth. Uh, Hi, Gabor. Just before you uh, take off your screen, we do have uh, one question. So I'm not sure if this is going to come up later in someone else's part, but it's a great question. Do you have any suggestions of where to purchase native plants? So in London, I guess. Yeah, so in London, uh, I'm, I'm just looking at our uh, plant and pollinator guide, uh, pollinator garden guide. Uh, so you can go to Hemans, Parkway Garden Center, Springbank Garden Center, although I think they just uh, moved. Uh, there's some other, uh, St. Williams, I, but I think that uh, they only sell to the bigger commercial uh, commercial scale. So, so the, yeah, the ones I listed, they should have native plants. Um, uh, th these are the ones that 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 come to mind. Uh, there's some the Hawth Hawthorne Farms, which is they, they usually come to the CD Saturday, and also uh, to other events. So I've I've bought seats from them. Uh, and, and you can also order from uh, many of these uh, places. I think there's some others that, uh, that are just uh, not coming up uh, in, from my memory bank, but uh, I, I'd be happy to, um, to answer that fully um, via email. So you, you can reach out to me and I, I'll, I'll try to uh, write down a more extensive list. So that's a great question. Thank you very much. That's great. That seems to be the only uh, other question that came in for now. You made reference to how to start a pollinator garden resource. I also wanted to mention that I've uploaded a couple of documents that are handouts um, that people can actually download right now if they want. So um, we'll probably send it up in the follow up email as well. But if you want right now, you can download there's how to start a pollinator garden and a pollinator pathways project mission statement. Yeah, that's yeah, excellent. So thanks so much for pointing that out. Okay, so now I'm going to give it uh, give the baton over to Sylvia. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Sylvia Sass. Uh, I'm a grade nine student at CCH, and uh, I recently joined Pollinator Pathway Project um, in April. And so since then, I have taken on the role of student liaison or coordinator between the youth um, at my school and possibly other schools I hope to uh, share this project with. Um, so I started, um, so I started a pollinator, or I will, start a pollinator pathway project at my own school. Uh, I reached out to the teacher who runs uh, Crusaders for the Planet uh, Club, and she's very enthusiastic about um, starting this and is totally on board with it. Um, there's a, a solid 20, maybe more, in this um, club group, and so that's really great because they're all really interested in this and just helping the planet, really, um, and pollinators. So while when we plant this garden, it's also really great um, a learning experience for all the plants that we're going to plant and um, the pollinators that it attracts. And um, I hoped that more students also get interested in this as they see this garden um, somewhere on CCH property. And uh, it would be really cool because it's important that youth uh, are aware of pollinators and their importance uh, in our food because over 85% of flowering plants need pollinators. Um, so it'd be really great to get more students because it's important for our future. And um, yeah, so um, that's pretty much it. I just, there's a little bit from me because uh, yeah, so just that it's good that if more youth are involved in this because it's great um, awareness about pollinators and how they're important in our everyday lives. Yeah, uh, we have one poll again for our third poll. 
and which is about, we would like to know how old you are all, uh, all are. So <laughs> there it is. Very interesting. They're on the um, higher end of the scale, but uh, it's great to have your youth perspective to just express the importance of um, getting youth involved, whether or not they're online tonight, but people who are listening, if they know youth, it's uh, great to try and introduce them to gardening and the importance of it. All right. I'll just quickly share the results. So, uh, 44% over 60. There you go. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Sylvia. And next up, we have Jute. So, you can go ahead and share your uh, camera. Hi, uh, my name is Jude Dealman. I'm also talking about getting young people involved. Um, I'm in grade nine. Um, yeah. So, um, I'm the second youngest member of the Pollinator Pathway Project, um, and I have joined last fall. Uh, so, getting young people involved in the Pollinator Pathway Project is very important. Um, not just the Pollinator Pathway Project, but other uh, pollinator projects, I guess. Um, uh, the reason for this is that pollinators are essential for a balanced ecosystem. One third of food is dependent on pollinators. Three quarters of food crops rely on pollinators to some extent. 90% of monarch butterflies have declined in the past 20 years. 37% of bee species are in decline. We need to act. Uh, we need to act soon. Once, as we saw from the poll, a lot of the people who are here are older. Um, and a lot of the people uh, who are interested in things like this are older. Younger people do not seem to get involved as much. And once a years pass by, we're not going to have old, the, some of the older people anymore. And the only people that are going to be left are going to be the younger people. And if the younger people don't care, then we're going to lose pollinators and all that stuff. Um, getting young people involved is not that easy as you saw from the poll a lot of people were older um i find that at my school um for people who are personally my friend it's easy to talk to them about uh things about um the ego uh like uh the environment and all that stuff and they'll listen to me because i'm their friend and they trust me um but other people who i don't know they won't listen to me because they think they're better than me. They don't think it matters. Um, my school has a lot of farming uh, kids. Their parents are all farmers. Um, lots of them. Um, so lots of them are not very mindful of them. Not that I want to put farmers in like a stereotype or whatever, but that's just what it seems to me. Um, and most of them do not care. They just don't feel that it matters. Um, so it's very hard to get young people involved. Um, so the two main places where I have contact with people um, who are not involved in this pollinator pathway project yet um, are people at my school and people at my church. My school is very community oriented. We have done multiple projects with neighborhoods around this, around that school and in London. Um, I do not think it will be hard for me to convince uh, the teachers at the school to get involved in the pollinator pathway project. Uh, we currently already have a pollinator garden. It is not part of the project though. It's not PPP garden. Um, um, and also we don't really talk about it. It's mostly just there and people see it and I've I've noticed it. Other people have noticed it. I'm sure half of the kids at the school wouldn't even know it's there. If, would be surprised if you told them it's there. Um, so I, I really would like to get people excited about that again and build another one or whatnot. Um, at my church, we have a few gardens. 
uh, they're not pollinator gardens, so they're mostly just for aesthetic purposes and to fill up space. Um, there are two large empty cement planters that they have there that are completely empty and just filling up with trash that people throw in there. Um, so I, I wanted to talk to the church about them and then about those planters and then uh, get those fixed up and put some a pollinator garden in there. Um, so yeah, that's mostly what I'm talking about. That's all that I'm talking about for getting young people involved. So yeah, thanks. A few questions have come in, so I may challenge you a little bit. <laughs> um, so I guess for someone on the line who's maybe older, and um, so what could they do, do you think, to get younger kids involved or younger people involved? Uh, for someone who's older, I would say find young people who trust you and who like to hang out with you. I don't know how, if you have like, like grandkids, children, whatever, neighborhood kids, and maybe start a pollinator garden, get them interested, and then they'll talk to you about it. And then, yeah, the rest is history, basically. Great, someone also asked, what is your plan for a career? <laughs> uh, my plan for a career, not really sure that much, um, but I am very interested in um, water, aquatic life and all that. I have a few aquariums and a pond, so I kind of wanted to go into marine biology, but I'm also very interested in music. So I don't know yet, but we'll see. That's great. I think uh, there's a couple other questions. They're not directly related to you, so we may move on for now. So with that, thank you very much, Jude, and uh, we can pass it over to Alex. All right, thank you, Kelsey. So I'm going to uh, quickly go over our website um, and essentially explain some of the key things on here that may be of interest for people as you are uh, looking for resources or wanting to continue expanding your own knowledge after this webinar. So if you come to our website, it's at the pollinatorpathwaysproject.com you will see this as the home page. Uh, the main thing I want to highlight right now is that uh, we're really trying to amp up our newsletter. Um, so if you are interested in getting kind of, uh, monthly updates from us, uh, I'd recommend that you can uh, do that here. Uh, so you can sign up here. I'll turn on my screen so you can see who's talking to you. Um, so yeah, so sign up here. This is just on the homepage. It's in a few other spots. Another thing that we're actively doing right now is trying to get a community submissions of people uh, who have pollinator gardens. If you have a sign, that's awesome. If you don't, that's totally okay. Even photos of pollinators, uh, we'd love to have you submit those. So you can send them directly to our email at pollinatorpathwaysproject at gmail.com or you can click the submit button and it'll open up an email link. Uh, one other thing, uh, someone had asked about if there is anything similar like this in Montreal. So I'll quickly uh, show you where you can access a bunch of references. Uh, right down here, we have a bunch of essentially cities that have similar pollinator uh, programs. So if you are on our website and you go to ideas, you can click on any of these cities and they will open up. Uh, likewise, if you wanted to see some of our information, some of our guides, these are in the handouts uh, that were sent to you. So that's essentially the PDFs for what these guides are. So take a look at those. Uh, it'll give you a good idea if you're say planning on creating a pollinator uh, website, uh, if you're planning on creating a pollinator garden, uh, this would be an excellent resource to start, whether you have a sunny garden, a shady garden, uh, you know, for wet swampy soil. So a list of species that you can go to to find uh, at say your local nursery or in some of the garden centers that are in London, like Gabor mentioned such as uh, Parkway Garden Center and Hemans. Uh, another section that I want to point out for people uh, is our FAQ section. So right here, 
depending on what it is that you're looking for, uh, we have some common questions that we are asked a lot and we'll leave a little bit of time about 10 minutes after this to uh, answer any of the remaining questions. But if there's something that, you know, it's not here in these eight or so, you can click directly right here. And if you fill this out, you can add your message or your question and we'll try and get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, we have Lori on the line as well here with us tonight. So if you have really specific uh, garden questions, she's the best person uh, to speak with. A few more things I'm quickly just gonna show you right now. Uh, if you are looking for a way to get involved that's more than just growing your own garden at home and you want to say contribute uh, to the Pollinator Pathways Project with some more of your time as a volunteer, we're all volunteers here uh, as well, then this is where uh, you can go to, to find out more information about that. You can click the volunteer button. Uh, the second thing that I wanna point out on this contact page is that we actually have a participatory map. So Gabor uh, had shown this uh, previously, uh, but essentially what this map is, is a bunch of people who have put down essentially their pins uh, so that you can see the, all the pollinator pathways around London. So how does this work? If you uh, click on this button, it'll open up a interactive Google map page. And in order to create a pin on this page, when you have your garden, you will have to come over, click on this edit button. And what that'll do is it'll give you access. So it's an open layer, open access map. So at this point, you zoom in, find wherever it is that your garden is. So we'll go to Victoria Park as an example. And what you can do is add right here where it says add marker at the top. Click that marker and create a pen. And you can write your address. You can write notes about what kind of vegetables or herbs or flowers you have in your garden. But this is a way for us to then look at on a greater scale, uh, what are all of those uh, gardens and what are those pathways throughout the city? Very similar to what Reforest London does with their a Million Tree Challenge. Uh, so again, if you're coming to this page, you're gonna click edit and then you're gonna add a marker up here. Uh, so one last thing to quickly go over, uh, we have a blog section as well. If you want to, uh, write an article, we'd love to have that. If not, there are some articles already here. So take a look at that. There's a lot of great information that's from our members. Uh, and lastly, because we are a, uh, not even a nonprofit, we're just a bunch of people in the community who do this because it's an important thing to do. Uh, we do have some expenses. Thankfully, we you know can host webinars like this that'll help raise awareness uh, and help educate people. But you know, maintaining the website, printing, getting flyers out to people, all of that does uh, have a cost. So we are actively applying for grants. This isn't the only source of income, but it is something that we would definitely appreciate uh, if you had that time and capacity. Um, and lastly, uh, just a quick shout out to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Those are where we are most active. Uh, so that is kind of a rundown of our website. Again, here's another way to sign up. But, uh, you know, if you don't want to volunteer, if you don't want to donate anything, if you just are here for information, I would definitely recommend signing up to our newsletter. I see a few people have already started to do that. So thank you very much uh, already on this call that you've signed up. So that's awesome to see. Uh, and yeah, that's kind of our website. Have a look. There's a lot of information there. Uh, so. Yeah, you can quickly come to the about section and you can actually see a little bit about all the people who are behind the organization as well, who you heard from some of tonight. Awesome, so I will stop uh, sharing my screen and I guess we can open up the floor for questions at this point. Uh, I would ask maybe the other people part of this if they wanted to come back on, turn on the webcam. Um, and that way if people have any questions, uh, depending on who they can fit, uh, who's best to answer them, we'll be happy to answer those questions for you. Um, 
And likewise, I'm not sure, Kelsey, is there any questions outstanding that we should kind of answer or that I can perhaps answer? Uh, so there were a couple of questions. First, I also have a couple more polls actually asking if people um, do follow you on social media or if they're signed up to the newsletter. So maybe I'll just launch those. And cool, uh, yeah. it also gives people another minute to kind of think of their questions and send them in. Okay, yeah, I uh, totally forgot to ask those poll questions. My bad. So let's ask the first one. Have uh, have people been to the website before? I believe. Does it count if they went 10 seconds ago? <laughs> <laughs> I will say that counts, yeah. Yeah, we can stop there. Great. And the next one, just do you follow them on social media? Most people are saying no, and I feel like that's probably a good thing. That means that there's lots of new uh, people in the audience that you're reaching today. So that's fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, if, <laughs> if you're interested to follow us on social media, uh, we post pretty consistently. It's pretty useful information, and it's just at Pollinator Pathways Project on uh, Facebook and Instagram. That's our handle. And I think the 70% also means that a lot of you are in your gardens, gardening, right? Because that's where I'd like to be, especially in the evening time. This is the per perfect time to be out in the garden. So so sorry to take take you away uh, from, from, the, <clears throat> from the special period of <laughs> gardening. But uh, yeah, so if, you have, if there's any questions, I would be happy to answer them. So one that I think Alex partially mentioned, it was how do you guys reach out and engage with other like-minded organizations? So I saw that on your website, you connect to other ones, but do you do any, anything beyond that to actually like connect with other cities that are doing similar projects? Yeah, Bor, we recently connected with that uh, woman in uh, Connecticut. Do you want to just explain a little bit about that? Yeah, that, that was really neat. That was our uh, our going global moment when um, when someone from this from the states uh, reached out. She found our website and uh, she fell in love with the 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 sign, and which you can also see in our T-shirt here. And uh, and sh she since she's setting up um, gardens of her own uh, and maybe a few uh, others across the, her city she, she she was asking whether we could send her a, a garden sign and um, what we ended up doing is we shared our pdf of, of the, the sign and so then she went to to her printer and printed it out so this is you know that plastic corrugated plastic and now there's a polymer pathway project sign with uh, I think it's Stonington or something like that. That's, that's the name of the town written above it. So, so we have connections to the States now. Uh, some of my former students ha are, are thinking uh, about setting uh, pathways up in Brampton. And, um, and I, I, we had some requests from Strathroy. So, so we, we are talking to people from other cities. Um, and and we we are definitely in contact with organize, local organizations. Many of us have, or because of the nature of our work, have already worked with uh, you know people at uh, TTLT, uh, Town Stable Land Trust, or Reforest London, or LEN. So we have and City of London. So we have really good relationships. And um, one of the things that uh, I've discussed with Skyler uh frank at, uh, at the london environmental network is to to host um a conference of uh mostly organizations but everybody would be welcome so individuals would be welcome to uh in in, in focusing our work on these cross city pollinator pathways because i think the way we build them is by having uh the organizations that i've mentioned uh, plus many others there's you know the list is really uh endless the local horticulture societies the there's urban league and the neighborhood associations uh because the way the um, the gardens work especially the ones on public land they were 
the way they work best is if there's a, a group that's actively looking after them, maintaining them, because there is some work. So once these gardens or meadows are set up, the, the work, um, you know, it, it gets less and less with time, but, but, but you know, there is maintenance in everything. So um, there's that upkeep and uh, it's important that we don't just set something up and then the group walks away. We need uh, engaged groups that look after them. So um, that's why it's really important to be talking to, you know, these, these groups of very various kinds. That's a good point because you can't just get it started and then lose interest and <laughs> you still have to maintain them. Mm -hmm. um, so the person just said uh, thanks for responding because they realize there's so many organizations working on similar issues across Canada and the U.S. So it's nice to see what other people are doing. Um, all right, we do have uh, actually a few people have asked how do they how do they get a sign? So a lot of people want signs for their own yards. Yeah, so they can they can contact us via email or one of the social media platforms uh, messaging us. Uh, right now we have uh, eleven in stock, as they say, but um, we 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 get uh, pr them printed on a regular basis. So if they they reach out, we can get them get them uh, out to them. Um, we do ask for a, a donation because you know it costs money uh, of, of fifteen dollars uh, if they could consider that, and and that goes. Um, uh, over well, ten dollars is the cost of printing them, and then five dollars is a, a donation to the organization. So if they could consider that. Um, is there a place where they pick them up, or do you drop them off to people? Yeah, we've had discussions about that um, because we, you know, we we are busy. But it, it seems like that my, my house has become the kind of the warehouse for that. <laughs> Maybe we'll set up. Um, I'll reach out to uh, Skylar and, and maybe we can have a stash over there as well. Uh, we'll that, yeah, the West Center Pond Center, there you go. <laughs> there you are, right? So that could be a, a good place where people can pick them up. So yeah, we're I working. I thought of that idea. We should have de like depots of signs around the city. <laughs> yeah, different community centers. There's, yeah, there you go. We've got new ideas. <laughs> uh, just moving on, we'll try to get to a few more. One uh, question is, urban sprawl is the main reason for habitat loss. Does this organization work on preserving any existing green spaces from developers? Okay, we, we are not, um, we're not focusing on that. You know, in the city, there are some, some organizations that do, um, that, that have that focus. So we are more uh, focusing on areas that have been already built up, that have been developed, and so we're looking at that urban fabric, that canvas, and then asking people, so over all this open space, and most of it, you know, is, is lawn, right? Now, ecologically, not very, uh, you know, not very helpful, not, not, not very beneficial. So, so that, that's our focus uh, and built up areas. But I mean, what this questioner is asking, that's also, that's also very much needed, but that's not our focus. So, good question. Thank you. Okay, I think that's mostly it. Oh, one more came in. We are at eight o'clock though, so um, in the interest of time, we can save the questions and we can reach out to everyone else later. Thanks very much for the Quickly, engagement. just to add, Kelsey, if people do still have questions or something more specific, uh, please feel free to follow up with us at Pollinator Pathways Project at gmail.com. Uh, I've been trying to answer the people's questions there. Some are pretty specific to their situation, uh, but that really is probably the best way for you to reach out for really specific or general questions because we can forward that or those emails to the respective people. That's great. Thanks for uh, typing out those responses too. That's awesome. Okay. Well, with that, I guess just once again, thanks to all the presenters tonight, uh, Dr. Sass and Jude and Sylvia and Alex and 
Um, thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. We had a really big group. Um, so hopefully you'll, you'll check out the next events too, and you'll get back to your gardens now. Absolutely. <laughs> right, and happy Canada Day too. Yeah, happy Canada Day. Thanks for organizing. Thanks, everybody. Uh, and thanks to all of you for attending. So have a great week. Take care.